Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Design Miami. My name is April Megan. I am Director of Global Partnerships for the fair. And again, it's um, a pleasure to welcome you to this Kohler talk on individualism and the spectrum of modernism. I'd like to introduce the esteemed panel, Dr. Daniela Ohad, Matteo Benetti, Renee Gonzalez, Chad Oppenheim, and Mark Bickerstaff. I hope that you enjoy, and welcome again. Thank you, April. And welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to do a little introduction to the talk because it really does need an introduction. We are going to talk about modernism. Uh, since the founding, since the foundation of the modern movement in the late years of the 19th century, the definition of what it means to be a modernist has shifted and altered over and over, reflecting the complexity and richness of this idiom, and of course the evolution of the time. So what does it mean to be a modernist today? Uh, and who are the modernists? This is going to be the topic of this talk today, this afternoon. And we are going to address the way in which individuality and personal touch have come to shape a new path into modernism in the eve of the third decade of the 21st century. So I want to just give a little bit of background, uh, which is going to be helpful for everybody to understand what is modernism. Uh, in the early years of the 20th century, with the establishment of the Garden City movement, modernists were those who were socially progressive, conscious about improving the environment, and critical about bourgeois social order. The modernists move away from the industrial cities to the countryside, seeking to live in peace with nature, fighting pollution, and restoring the crafts. So this was at the very early uh, years of the 20th century. Um, and also to live in the untouched prairies this is the Frank Lloyd Wright house, by the way. In the 20s and 30s, being a modernist meant to be revolutionary, to build stark structures of flat roofs, glass walls, and reinforced concrete. Being a modernist meant to abandon, to get used to this, to abandon the um, ornaments and historical references, and to create the utopia of the future. This is a Bauhaus celebrating a 100th anniversary next year. Uh, the modernists sought to rethink the world through a new architecture and created affordable homes seeking to enable the masses to live modern. In the post-war years, uh, okay, here. The post-war years, the formula to become a modernist was well defined by museums, tastemakers, magazines like this one, and manufacturers across disciplines. They made it easy for the public to comprehend modernism. A, and to live the modernist ideal. Living in suburban America, adapting the glamour and stylish imagery formulated by madmen. That meant to be a modernist. So in all of these 
examples from the past, being a modernist meant to be visionary, revolutionary, inventive, forward-looking, standing at the forefront and thinking about grand context. And today, we are going to talk about what does it mean to be a modernist today, when the design world is really flooded with countless of expressions of form, style, and innovation. In fact, there was no other moment when becoming a modernist has been so personal, individualistic. So how can we cultivate modernist taste, lifestyle, and vision? We want to understand what it means to be a modernist today. And this talk is brought by Kohler. Here. Okay, by Kohler. Uh, whose yearly global theme for 2018 is called Spectrum of Modernism, Minimalism to Maximalism. Kohler perceives itself as a leading modernist company and since founding its foundation in 1873, it has focused on product services for homes and lifestyle. So I want to ask Mark, Mark, you are the first one. Uh, Mark, uh, I think this period we really remembered as a seminal moment of eclecticism in history. If we're gonna look at this period like 100 years from now, and you have decided to uh, focus on the word modernism, on the concept modernism. What makes Color, Color a modernist company? Uh, I think there's a fundamental ethos here, which is I think we're modernist because we don't stand for an expression that's stylistic or even culturally nationalistic. We, we believe in living by and designing by a set of values. And those values in the modernist contest being believing in the future and then believing that we can design and invent a better future. Um, and encouraging our customers to really relish and adopt the newest and the latest designs no matter what and not keep looking backwards at sources of inspiration. And that of course is a challenge because culture is full of innovators and moderates and conservatives and our belief is that it's up to us as a, a manufacturer to do better every time we create product, to deliver better things and more modern things, to solve problems in better ways. Here are some of your products. I, I want to speak to Renee about your architecture. You are, you want to create architecture that is relevant, and you are very concerned and sensitive to issues that are relevant right now, like global warming. What makes you a modernist? I don't know that I, I don't know that I am a modernist. I, I do uh, honest work. I think that it's work that is um, addressing environmental issues because I think that now more than ever, we have to build sensitized cities that are that much more experiential than, they, than they've ever been. And I think as a, as a result, uh, we have to think about environmental issues, think about uh, uh, sort of a cultural engagement, buildings that are engaged with the community. Um, and so as a result, we have been working on a number of projects that address environmental issues. I think we're in the perfect place to do that. The city of Miami is uh, the city that is at the most in, in risk. Um, these are a series of my projects, but the city of Miami is, is really, has the most in assets uh, at risk in this battle against global warming. And I think that it's our responsibility to, to address that. We have been working with the city of Miami Beach to develop a, a new code that now allows uh, elevated houses. We've been uh, working on a number of houses that are elevated upon stilts and that 
uh, address uh, sea level rise in a, in a more poetic way. In other words, I think we as, as designers and architects need to be at the forefront of uh, thinking of creative ways to uh, address this topic uh, rather than simply be reactive. Um, so um, that's some of, the, some of the work that I am doing. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's modern by default. I mean, it's just a, a reality that, that we have that is uh, relevant, right? Um, so I, I want to start with addressing the uh, concept of modernism and how each one of our panelists is related to modernism, whether it's my own interpretation or yours. So I want to speak to Mattia. We've known each other for many, many years. And Mattia, you started to challenge the language of minimalism, which is traditionally associated with uh, modernism very early on in the 80s. And this is what, what this is, what is this? This is the, house, the couture house of Christian Lacroix, which I designed with my ex-partners in 1987 in Paris. So when, uh, I have to say that when I put this image in my Instagram and I ask, is this modernist? I got so many comments, oh no, it's not, it's not. But I wanna say that to me, uh, one aspect in your work, very fundamental aspect, does make you a modernist, your craftsmanship. Craftsmanship has been one of the most, the key principles in the, in the modern movement from the very beginning, and that's something that's very important to you. Do you perceive yourself as a modernist? Well, I never ask myself that question directly, but somehow I do think that I'm a modernist, yes. Uh, on the other hand, I'm very traditional because uh, craftsmanship, as you just said, is uh, something that it's, it's, it's almost, I would say, a priority in, in my work. So, I don't know. <laughs> am and, and am I or am I not a modernist? It's for the people to say, not, not for me. Well, uh, can I say? <laughs> you can, <laughs> definitely, yeah. So, these are pieces that you, new pieces that you have designed recently and that are shown here by Paul Kosmin uh, Gallery. Uh, now I want to talk to Chad about that, the exactly same aspect. So you, I remember when we spoke on the phone, you told me you're not sure, you're a modernist. So, well, to me you are, and I want to tell you why, and then you, let's talk about it. Um, I think the modernist aspect of your practice is the connection of architecture to the nature. Very strong connection to you, nature really almost architecture lets nature speaks, and you're very interested in the most primitive experience. Do you perceive yourself as a modernist? It seems like modernism's a dirty word in this uh, <laughs> panel here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess when we spoke, I, I, I was thinking more of myself as a caveman than a modernist, but, um, you know, I, I think that modernism, maybe as we're dealing with it, is more of a, a period of of design time, but in reality, I think it's probably more about a philosophy, about exploring conditions that we exist in today in the world and reacting to them in the way that we all feel is relevant. So Renee speaks about global warming and how we can, we can deal with that craftsmanship and uh, pursuing, you know, enhancing life for, for people who are uh, needing you know, faucets and toilets. And, and I, I remember growing up, these incredible Kohler faucets that you know look like the Jetsons uh, stuff so I think we're all in our own ways dealing with the world as we see it and reacting to it and, and for me uh, you know we're focused very much on on the natural world and we believe that architecture can almost disappear and and become more of a, a, a way of framing and seeing the world and, and and reconnecting to the world and and I think you know part of the reaction that, that I have to current affairs is, you know, we've become so fascinated and entrenched in technology that we're becoming disconnected from our, the world that surrounds us and the world that 
um, you know, we're trying to preserve. So for us, our, everything we're doing is trying to reconnect people to the world around them, reconnect them to the beauty of nature, and also reconnect us to each other because, you know, we've become so isolated in our pursuit of, uh, you know, the latest and greatest things and, and, and total stimulus all the time. So these are the things that we're reacting to in a modern sensibility, I guess. So, so as, as, I, as I mentioned in my introduction, that uh, the connection with nature was really very much at the roots of the modern movement when the arts and crafts and the garden city. And Mark, I want to ask you that um, one of the things that I found, first of all, I want to tell you that call, what color to me. Color to me, personally, is this, um, something that you have a guarantee for timeless and quality. Because every bathroom and kitchen I've ever done, and I've done several, I knew that if I go to Kohler, I don't have to look elsewhere. So to me, Kohler is really classic. But one of the things that I found fascinating about the way you work is how you established design studios in various places in the world to connect to the DNA of the culture and you do different things for different cultures. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that you can chart the evolution of Cola as a business from its, you know, classic American roots to, you know, the last 30 or so years where we've embraced the world. And as we did that, it became very, very clear that it was impossible to simply say, I know what it's like to be in China or Malaysia or even Europe by designing out of the US, by designing out of Wisconsin, which is our, our corporate home. Um, because the realities are that, as I said earlier, you know, if you, we fundamentally believe we're a modernist business in the sense of designing to the context of the world that really matters, purposeful design. And you, you know, so we're not exporting US design. So to be culturally relevant and to do that remotely is incredibly difficult for any designer. And so we made that step of saying the only way really to get insight into what is really happening at a cultural level, what is really happening in people's homes, is to be there with them and to put designers, the people who are there to sense and understand that experience, put them close to those people. Um, and so we embarked upon that and we, we started in China and we've got a big studio there now. We have studios in, in India now, in Singapore, in the UK, in Europe, and we see that model expanding as we start to develop different markets around the world. Because you have to be relevant, you have to be meaningful to the customer, and that is, that is the key to everything that we do. And, and the whole balance between globalism and locality is really important today, and I want to explore that with all of you. Uh, with Rene, you um, really um, very, uh, let me see this, hold on a minute. I just want to bring one of your images. Um, can you tell me, this is a famous project that you have done in Miami, the Prairie Avenue residence, and I want to bring a couple of images. Can you say how this building reflects the locality well this 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 house couldn't reflect the locality more uh, than any other example so thank you for bringing this up um, it's it's a house that we've uh, completed recently it's elevated on stilts it's actually literally uh, two blocks from here it's a land lot so as a result we internalized the house um, so in, in that, even in that uh, uh, scale, it, it, it is affected by uh, its location. Um, we, we elevated this house uh, to address environmental issues. Um, at the moment at which we did, it, it presented a series of opportunities. So uh, you start to get breezes under the house. So you get a cooling effect that you don't otherwise. Uh, you start to get vegetation uh, growing under the house. You can use uh, this space, uh, especially in a tropical environment like this. 
So the the house is really responding directly. It's it's also uh, an interest of ours to connect uh, with nature and with the environment in the way you see here in this image, where entire spaces are, are opened up and thresholds are, are dissolved. Um, so the, the connection to the environment, the connection to Miami Beach is very important in this house. I think for me, the, the most uh, successful thing about this house is, and, and there may be some people from the city of Miami Beach here that I saw earlier and, and were going to come because they're very excited about this house. And that's been, for me, um, you know, talk about relevancy. That, that for me has been uh, the most satisfying thing because uh, the city uh, embraced the project and as a result, as I was saying earlier, invited me to work with them to affect the code. They were uh, very resistant initially because at the moment at which you raise a house, that means you, you've got there essentially... Is this, this, is the this is the underside of the house, right? Uh, so at the moment at which you raise a house, you basically have a two-story, a three-story, right? Because you take a, a, essentially if, you, if, if uh, height limitations only allow you for, to have a two-story and you raise it, you have a three-story. So there was a lot of hesitation about what that meant in relation to historic homes that are adjacent and so forth. Uh, we From which period when you're talking about this? Uh, houses that were built here in the 20s, especially around the Venetian. So I, I think the exciting thing is that they saw in this house an opportunity to make a change that will uh, allow the next generation of homes in Miami Beach to be uh, resilient. And, and not only that, but uh, it, it will al allow for a city that is uh, more sensitive, if you will. Because if you imagine driving on the Venetian islands, and you imagine driving along the perimeter roads of the Venetian islands, and having a series of elevated homes, which gives you an incredible amount of openness and air and porosity at the street level, like, like you see in, in this home, uh, then I think you can immediately understand how wonderful and it could be to have this connection to the environment as someone that is just driving through, not, not, not only as someone that's inhabiting the home. So, uh, so I mean, I'll, I'll, so let, it I'll let is, others speak. It is a Miami Beach house. It's a Miami Beach house. It's, it's, it, it can In be a so house. In so many levels. It can be a house that ca uh, can be seen as, uh, a, it's a tropical house. It's a house yes. that. And, and is layers, yes, of course. And Mattia, I wanted to talk to you about being about a locality. Many people think that you are French. Um, do you know that? No, that I don't know. <laughs> because I live there and work there. Right, yes. but you were born in Switzerland, you yes. grew up in Switzerland, and you made Paris your home yes. when you started your career. Um, and, and I know that people buying your work because, um, because they want that French quality, that French mm. taste, that French... So, do you perceive yourself as French? I know that your inspiration is very much going back to French history. Yes. Do I perceive myself as French? I don't know, as European for sure, and probably French also. But and what? you, yeah, mm. go, go ahead. I don't know if I... Well, what? I where, where is your source of inspiration? You, you know French history are, yes, very well. Course. Yeah. Yes. Um, I look at historical pieces, also very, very old. But of course, I live now, so I, I try to, to incorporate that history into my work, but without being historical, of course. So I, I don't know. And, and I think it's that a, when you were working together with Christian Lacroix yes. in the 90s, it was very 80s. much a very good mm. marriage this way. Yes, because, well, that was a very special job because, um, it, I mean, we responded to, to his goal and to his needs 
because it's uh, it's about fashion. It's about and uh, and we try to work with his uh, with his own imagery as well because uh, it was very strong and we we needed to represent his work into an environment and into the furniture and um, and also because there were no fashion houses I mean haute couture houses made since uh, I don't know since the immediate post-war so it was something very different very new it had to be historical it had to be French it had to be Christian Lacroix but it has it had also to represent myself so uh, we invented a whole language. A language, yeah. a yes. Sort of you language definitely for him. have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and you've known for that. Uh, Chat. And, oh, and, also, and also, we incorporated a lot of nature in that, in that job. So, just to, to continue what Sorry, the other like, panelists uh, said. Yeah, like yeah. here, yeah. yeah. Um, Chad, I wanted to talk to you about locality because you are like William Morris. You want to build in local materials. It's very important to you. How, how, how do you do that? Yeah, so um, strangely enough, most of our work is all around the world. It's not in, scattered in, in Miami. And uh, what we love to do is come to a place with a fresh set of eyes and really try to understand uh, what the possibilities of life are in these places, uh, you know, to enhance people's lives, uh, as you were saying. So uh, the first house was in the Bahamas. This is in Los Angeles. So speaking about Los Angeles, there's always been this incredible exploration of the potential of, of residential living. Uh, some of the projects you showed uh, in your initial slides reference that. Uh, so we wanted to kind of take that as far as we possibly can um, in Los Angeles. This is in, in the desert in Jordan, uh, where we actually just extracted uh, the rock. That's kind of the caveman analogy. But we, we began to be inspired by uh, how people built in the desert 2,300 years ago. The Nebataeans built Petra, which is a city carved out of stone, and we thought, you know, why not do a similar thing uh, for today? So the idea was really not to bring in any uh, extra materials that we needed. So here we were just carving out of the rock, we were bringing in glass and cement, but we're really trying to, to use what materials are there locally. And, and, and are these materials uh, typically used in that part of the world, in well, like residential or other buildings? Well, I mean, this was used historically, right? Petra was just carved into the mountains that existed. Uh, in the Bahamas project, we tried to analyze the history of the island and what was being built for hundreds of years. And uh, one more back. This yeah. one. Yeah, so it's, it's using local woods and, and even just more, even exploring. I find a fascination with, um, without technology. So how, how did people live hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago like you see in Jordan without technology and analyze that, you know, big overhanging roofs, uh, you know, screens over the windows, cross ventilation, uh, really about mitigating climate in the most primitive way possible. So we're trying to explore this kind of future primitive where we're going back to more simple ways of, of mitigating the environment. Uh, this idea of architecture without architects, I, I find it fascinating where it's not about style, it's not about period, it's about you know what they use the materials that they had, where they lived, they used technologies that existed. And even though we have the technologies, I think that it's a, it's a discipline to kind of pull yourself back with that. And, so uh, do you feel when you go to these places, I know you build in the Middle East, do you feel that that places really feed you architecture and your concepts? Yeah, I mean, every place does. Um, we're working in like um, 20 different countries at the moment. So I, every place I, I go, I'm from New Jersey. So we finally got our first project in New Jersey that we finished last year. So every place to me is like an exciting place to visit coming from New Jersey. You know, it's like everything is very exotic. You told me you are a New Jersey yeah. boy. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I, I come to each place with like just, you know, an incredible childlike curiosity and almost in a way, uh, I, I think of it as like archaeology where you're like uncovering the truth and the history and, uh, and, and try to kind of tap into that spirit of place. 
Um, and, and that's really what we're trying to do. We want something to feel like it's been there. Maybe it's been there hundreds of years. It could be something from the future. We just want to make something that feels truthful to its environment and deals with things in a, in a very sincere way. And, and really always about this focus about seeing the world and framing the world and, and celebrating the beauty of the world. I totally love this. I, I visited in Petra One day. and I yeah. totally can connect, understand. The biggest it. tourism in Jordan is Israelis, so there you go. Welcome. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mark, I want to ask you about this campaign or this uh, theme uh, modernism. Um, and Modernism, minimalism to maximalism, which is exactly what we're talking about. It's how wide the spectrum is. But I want to ask you if people who buy your products, is the fact that they understand the concept, does this fact give them an extra layer of experience? Uh, for sure. I mean, absolutely, I think it does. And that's... That's our aim without it necessarily being needing to understand that. You know, we don't expect people to be able to uh, break down the context of our products. But what we do expect them to, or we hope, what we aim for is that the fundamental meaning that they take away from whatever it is we create connects to them. And that we layer into that then a better experience. You know, everything we do that's new has to be a better experience than the last has to be a better sustainability story, has to be moving ourselves forward, or we shouldn't do it. And we did this campaign really because in our experience and with a lot of our customers, we felt that people were getting trapped behind the early 20th century description of being a modernist, that it had to be minimalist, that it had to be in some way reduced to its simplest and most basic elements. And we, we wanted to challenge that because we this actually, is reduced, this particular piece. This is reduced, and if you look at the fundamental form, I mean, this is a spout. But what we've done is then say, well, where do you bring through, you know, original thinking and richness? And so this has this incredibly beautiful ombre finish, which fades from a, a sort of titanium through to a rose gold, and it brings a sophistication and a way of designing expression into the bathroom that's layering upon a minimalist backdrop. And I think minimalism as itself it gives you all sorts of opportunity to layer in detail and expression in new ways and ultimately to explore new ways of delivering you know, experience to the customer. That's really interesting. And I know that there are a couple of products by Kohler that are standing Yeah, right we've there. got these exact, these exact examples no. yeah. just out there. I mean, really just as a little signal to say, you know, we believe in the future and we believe in exploring and experimenting to create a new, a new and better future. And that's, that's really what we're focused on. And you are very particular about the concept of this panel as well, to really reflect that belief. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we, we're delighted to be involved in things like this with such a great panel of people because conversation and, you know, differences of opinion is how we move ourselves forward. You know, this inter interaction is how we move our thinking forward and explore new avenues for the future. You know, I love this idea of this future primitive, this modernist primitive, which, you know, is all sorts of connotations And to also it. what Mattia is doing, like looking backward and creating something that is so current. Absolutely, you know, and that element of, you know, uh, historically influenced but not historical. Yes, exactly. So, uh, Renee, I want to ask you about this project. Did you go to this auction last night? Yeah, of course. I yes. was supposed to do my homework. Tell me, how was it? You designed the auction, the, the space for the auction for red. Yeah. Uh, has anybody been in the auction last night? <laughs> so, Hi, David Gill. Yeah, it's an amazing uh, organization that is... Uh, it's spearheaded by Bono, and uh, they raised money uh, for AIDS, and so it was something we did because uh, we believed in it, and uh, I think that's what we're all talking about to a certain extent is, is what's 
what's modern is, is believing in something at the moment, and this is something that's very important. So we uh, designed the installation, not the table that's on the screen. I know, I didn't <laughs> have the image of it, but tell us about it, and you also did a booth here. Uh, yeah, the booth is at the entrance, uh, uh, around the, the entrance as soon as you walk in. And the whole idea uh, about the booth was to create, uh, develop a very uh, minimalist uh, booth. It was a very minimalist gesture to intrigue people and really get them excited about going to see uh, the installation in the Moore building, which is in the design district, and um, r really create a situation where they would uh, go there and see in the, the Moore building is uh, essentially a hypa style hall the, where the exhibition is hung. And so our idea was to have beams and columns kind of disappear and create a very light filled environment uh, that would be uplifting uh, given and the, the severity red, of the issue. And very red, the whole building you let in yeah. red. That's <laughs> amazing. And I think that most of the pieces in the auction are made in red including the Zaha Hadid table in red. Um, okay, so, yeah, uh, so but please they, go. They raised, yeah. they raised an enormous amount of money, so it was uh, very I can successful. Imagine. How about the diamond ring? Yeah. Wow, okay. That's sold as well. It's very special. It's uh, that we have a hologram of it because it's entirely made of diamond. There's no structure to it. I know, it's so cool. Um, Mattia, um, I recently had a conversation with your dealer, David Gill, and I want to ask you the same question that I asked him. What is it that, oh, this is a diamond ring, sorry. What is it really that you, the secret, your secret of staying at the forefront for that many years? We see style change, change we see people change, we see different times, and trans and you are like there untouched yeah. how do you know that I am untouched I, I follow you yeah. <laughs> well, and, and also you you the work that you do in in you you do you don't have like a language you have collections yes I, I'm I mean I'm, I'm very open you know I, I, I don't I can make very different things in the same, at, at the same time because, the, I, because I feel different all the time. So I, I, the, what I design comes out naturally, I would say. And, and you also designed the booth here, yes. Paul Kasmin booth in yes. black and white, yes. which gives those objects amazing background. Well, what, what was the, what was behind that? Well, what was behind that, it was the idea of uh, giving the, 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 the pieces um, a, a very clear designed background and to see how they could be integrated into something very, very minimal, very modern, very, very simple. And, uh, As and, and by, also by playing contrasts, I think which I think it's very, I mean, it's very important. As, as I was saying, I, I mean, I, I could design this in the morning and something very different than the, in the afternoon, and, and the which I do every day. And the array of materials that you use are yes. oh, just amazing. Yeah. 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 Because, yeah. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, because so. Because that's the way I function, yeah. I mean. I can't help no, it. I, know. I can't help it. Yeah. I, I know, mm -hmm. and it's always mm -hmm. surprising. It's mm -hmm. always different. I mean, years after years, and you mm -hmm. always, you always succeed to surprise everyone. Um, Chad, I wanted to talk to you about. You told me that you have two architects that you like. Like, how would you say? Admire, inspired by. Um, can you talk about that? What did you learn from Louis Kahn, and what did you learn from uh, Peter Zumthor? It's hard to kind of pick two because we're inspired by so many things and so many artists and 
designers as well. So uh, for us, I, I think Louis Kahn just has an incredible truth and sincerity about the work. Um, and you know, the Salk Institute is just one of these incredible places that you know, this courtyard, the way it ignites with the sunset and you know, it, it almost like lights up the water. Just that, you know, very simple forms, very simple um, ideas, limited palette of materials, but creating this incredible power, this incredible... Have, have you been to the Salk Institute? I, I have, yeah, have. it's like a, a family yeah. pilgrimage. We bring all the, uh, the But kids. also very powerful in photography. Yes. Those two architects. Yeah. Is this something that you feel... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's about creating atmosphere. I mean, the other is Zumthor image. I, I mean, it's a very nice project, but maybe Vols might have been more uh, appropriate uh, for my thoughts. But I, I think, you know, it's, it's once again using, lo in this image, like, you know, using local materials. It's almost like the river stone becomes materialized into the building and, and techniques that have maybe existed. But it's the idea of doing things in, in an elemental way, not, you know, and it's not, that's like your first thought necessarily it's like how do you get down to the essence of doing something where there's in a way almost like no design it's just it has to be that way it has to be that way to answer the questions and to provide that that truth so I mean that's just what we're searching for it's about creating an atmosphere it's about just creating incredible experiences for people to enjoy also, some of my favorite architects. And I wonder, Renee, I want to ask you, um, have you seen Matthias' book? Yeah, of course. Of course. Tell, tell us something about how you felt. <laughs> tell me, tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to put me on the spot. Huh? Um, no, listen, I mean, I think obviously our vocabularies are very different. I respect Matthias immensely. I think that uh, the work, the, uh, the, the reason I, I respect the work and I, and I respect him is because it's obviously coming from the heart. It's, it's authentic work. And I think, uh, you know, circling around to the topic of, of this conversation, I think uh, to, to I don't know what it means to be modern. To be modern is simply to do authentic work that is relevant at the time, that is important to you, that is responding to real uh, issues of the moment. And, you know, Mateus is doing that. And, and so as a result, I respect him greatly. I personally like the work very much. Uh, whether you do or you don't, I think that's the important issue. Uh, Mark, you live in London, and I wonder when you looked at Renee's house, do you, how, m how Miami do you feel about it? Uh, we, yeah, I think it's very relevant to the context, you know. Um, the environment in London is so completely different that, you know, you, I can imagine a house like that in London, but would it connect to the context of the place as strongly as it does in Miami? No, it wouldn't. And I think that's, you know, I go back and wholeheartedly agree with what's been said, which is, you know, truthfulness, honesty, and authenticity in design is obvious. And I think it comes through in a lot of the work we've seen from everybody here today. And perhaps that's a core element of modernism and one that's being liberated more and more in the modern world with access to you know, rapid manufacturing, it's more, it's easier today to make products than it's ever been. The techniques are there, craft is being restored. So in modern industrial craft is liberating new ways of expressing yourself. And I think authenticity of what is what makes that purposeful and meaningful. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, it would be fascinating to do a project in London and then see the result uh, in a different form. And I'm sure it would be very different. I didn't know. Chad, I want to ask you about, you are a New Jersey boy. What is your perception on color? Of on color. Color, yeah. Very nice accent. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I, I got into architecture. Uh, my parents uh, built a house when I was seven, and I would sit down with the architect and, and work with them, and, and that's how I became fascinated. And I just, I mean, 
my memories are just these incredible faucets, these incredible designs. Um, and for me, it's, it's something that was always kind of pushing the forefront of, of design. And uh, I just felt very intrigued by it at a, at a very young age. So. so I would like to take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have, Paula, do you have the microphone? Okay, to any one of the panelists, a question. First one. I'm going to pick you up. If you <laughs> I, I know some of the people here. <laughs> so, okay, Daria, why won't we start with you? She didn't ask. I'm assigning her a question, but she's a very smart architect, so. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, so, actually, I have a question for Mark. And my question is really in looking at architecture and the architecture that we've seen of the Project Stone today that are addressing the environmental issues that Miami is going to face with, uh, with rising sea levels and, um, and water conservation. I mean, obviously, we have already had changes in low flow um, uh, uh, um, fixtures. But how do we now maybe, like the way the design has changed of architecture to address it, um, how is the design, do you see the design in the future changing uh, to address those issues? Uh, yeah, well, it, it's, it's changing now and it will continue to change, you know, especially in an urban context, there's incredible challenges on resources and how we, you know, simply unsustainable to to continue to design bathrooms the way we do today with the change in the urban environment and you know we're very actively working on on research and development to look at you know totally different not just individual products that work with less resources i mean if you go outside and the, the restrooms here you're using cola waterless urinals for instance so that technology exists that's just the surface level we have to go beyond that and we have to go beyond that to look at the whole systematic way we think about water, we think about waste, and redesign and create new solutions. And we're actively doing that. So, you know, we're collaborating with some incredible people who are working on waterless systems for, for waste, but also completely different ways of creating infrastructure for waste. Um, you know, that's the reality of my job. You know, we do the pretty things, and then we, we get down and dirty with what happens in the, in the toilet. So. Uh, you know, we have to work on all aspects. Okay, any question? Um, okay, how about George? <laughs> um, I don't really have a direct question. You've all uh, pretty much summed it up, but I do want to compliment Kohler and the directions that they're taking now. 25 years ago when I did a bathroom, I would have looked to Kohler for a nice cast iron bathtub. But I went to European manufacturers for my fixtures. Maybe six to ten years ago, I would have went to Waterworks for fixtures. Two years ago, I went all Kohler because the fixtures like they just showed you have taken out a good modernist sensibility and they're very beautiful now, whereas I had always went by them. They were so traditional. There was no innovation in, in their fixtures. But now I think they really have summed it and really nailed it. They're really nice. So, and and you, you guys are much. all doing good work, but I mean... <laughs> Thanks very much. Free advertising. Thank you, George. And yes, just hold on a second. Thank you. No, it's okay. No, it should be on. All right. What I'm going to ask you is, what are some of the technological innovations that really get your blood pumping that have shown up in the last five to ten years? Carbon fiber material, extra strength, and certain things that, that give you more freedom in the design of your architecture. Just, just pick two things. You know. Even if they're old style. You know, I think one of the great things is that finally in Florida, uh, solar energy is going to become something that we're going to be able to uh, utilize because uh, there's been kind of a, a monopoly uh, that has not allowed that to happen. Um, I, you know, for me, I think it's about using. Um, systems and materials uh, in, in ways that are um, sometimes standard. And in other words, at the moment, 
just to use an example of the, of the house, at the moment at which you elevate the house, you get breezes flowing underneath. That doesn't necessarily require, or you get cross ventilation, uh, that doesn't necessarily require innovation. So I think I, I personally fall back a lot on um, ways of doing things that are reasonable and rational. And yes, of course, you use you know uh, materials that have certain R values, that have this, that have that, and, and that's kind of almost like math. But I think uh, to then uh, pull the conditions together in a way that just makes sense is, uh, for me, always the, the sort of fallback position. So the question today was, who are the modernists? And I hope that we learn all about who are the modernists today and what does it mean to be a modernist. So thanks for the panel, and thanks for you, and thanks for Design Miami. Thank you.